Greetings and welcome to podcast 13 of Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. So we're going to get right into the reading. There are two ways to be in the sky, flying or falling. I prefer flying. Flying. When the musical dream I had as a young boy came true, the cartoon characters chasing me turned out to be characters in a movie called Space Jam. The film featured the very song I had dreamt about, I Believe I Can Fly. The fact that the animated live action film was about basketball and star Michael Jordan, who along with Muhammad Ali was my biggest inspiration outside of the music world, made everything even better. If you came up when I did, if you played hoop, and if you were raised in the streets of Chicago, Michael Jordan was the man. Even before joining the Bulls in 1984, Michael was a master hoopster at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. For us, Michael redefined the game by bringing a skill set unlike anyone before him. Not only did he have the most competitive spirit we've ever seen, he also had moves we'd never seen. As a ball player, he was a poetry in motion. He could twist, turn, fake, and fly. He could hit from the outside. He could hit from the inside. He could move to the hoop like a bolt of lightning. He could slam with the fierceness of an angry ego. He could shoot it soft. He could bring it hard. There wasn't anything the man couldn't do. Earlier in the 90s, after Honey Love hit, I was walking around the hood when I heard some kids screaming, Michael's coming, Michael's coming down the street to see his mama. I looked and saw a crowd of people waiting in in front of a house. I didn't want to seem like a groupie, but hell, I wanted to see Michael Jordan just like everyone else. I wanted to see the greatest basketball player in the history of the game. A few minutes later, Michael himself came riding up in a motorcycle. Kids flocking around him screaming for autographs. I didn't want to look uncool, so I stood back. After signing a few autographs, he looked up and saw me, our eyes locked. A second passed. Did he recognize me? Hey, R. Kelly, what you doing around here, man? The kids got a little excited seeing me. A lot less excited, though, than they were to see Michael Jordan. I walked over to him. Michael, I said, oh, can't tell you what you mean to me growing up. A bunch of other words of praise fell out my mouth. I kept blabbering about how much I admire him. Hey, man, said Michael, I can't sing, but you can. Well, I said, you know, I also play ball. What do you mean, brother? You don't got no game? In a good nature way, he started giving me a hard time. My game is pretty good, I said. I've kept up over the years. I hoop almost every night. Well, keep playing, baby. And more important than that, keep singing. Can't stop either one. That little encounter made a big big impression on me. Michael couldn't have been any nicer. When I was about 10, George Benson, the greatest love of all, blew me away. I had a desire to write a song like that, one that reminded kids they could achieve anything and be anything if they believed and worked hard at it. Michael Jordan gave me that chance when he asked me to write something for a 1996 part cartoon, part live action film, Space Jam. I Believe I Can Fly became my biggest crossover hit, reaching number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the UK pop charts. Believe it or not, it took me all of three hours to write because the tune first came to me as a child. I really do believe God actually wrote that song. He just used me to get it out there. I prayed over the project at the time I was going through a lot, lawsuits, backbiting, fake friends, and folk were more interested in my money than in me. The song ministered to me, made me feel good, gave me life. It was more powerful than anything I'd ever done musically. I have never gotten over my fear of flying in airplanes and don't think I ever will. You have to practically knock me out and throw me in the baggage compartment to get me on a plane. Isn't it strange that a guy who hates flying can pin an anthem about soaring through the sky? This is only one of the reasons I'm convinced God was involved. He put that particular song out there for everyone, including me, who needed to believe that they can achieve, that they can rise above any challenge. My mother used to always tell me, meet greatness where it is, which meant we all walk on the ground. I tried to remember her words when I was hanging with Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. But every now and then, 
I had to pinch myself. One of those times was when I was playing a game on one-on-one -on -one with Jordan. I was inspired by the fact that he was so approachable and down to earth. The score was 32 to one. I might have lost pretty badly, but I won a chance to play against the man. Years later, after the movie came out and the song started soaring, I kept thinking about that first time I met Michael Jordan outside my mother's house on Chicago Street. I believe I can fly, travel all over the world, won three Grammys and so many other awards. I can't remember them all. It launched me into a new orbit. Until then, I've been seen as a sexy R&B singer. I could talk about the crotch on you. I could get the ladies to sex me, to hump and bounce and go down low. I could sing pretty ballads asking you to step into my room before I believe I could fly. If someone had asked me, a music critic, if R. Kelly could write a purely inspirational song, the answer would be, you kidding? Not R. Kelly. He's too busy with the bump and grind. Maybe the only one who wasn't surprised at the success I believe I could fly was me. I say that because these kinds of songs had always lived inside my soul. I call them faith anthems. They're songs that affirm my faith in God, God's faith in me, and my faith in myself. There were as deep a part of me as homie lover friend or seems like you're ready. I knew I'd been right, writing these kinds of songs for the rest of my life. I knew that my next album would be to go to a whole new level. I had, lift, I had lifted the bar higher, which is just what I wanted to do. After all, that's what Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali did. They all went for the gold and they got it. Whether I liked it or not, my blessing and burden were to try to outdo myself every time I stepped into the ring of fire. That ring burned brightest in my studio. In the mid 90s, something else was happening in music studios across the world. Something as hot as the hottest R&B, the deepest faith anthem, or the most seductive dance groove. Rap had taken his place at the center of the musical universe. Some singers started complaining about that. Some said that rappers only rap because they can't sing. I didn't see it that way. I'd grown up with the rap music from the earliest days. I appreciated rap just like I did all music. And I recognized the stories. I was influenced by the singer, Hill, um, the Sugar Hill Gang, Grandmaster Flash, and Curtis Blow. Everybody knew those lyrics. Times change and musical styles start to merge. I got upset when I hear, I get upset when I hear a rapper say, I ain't no R&B singer. They want to say that soft. I'm not the guy that you want to say, oh, that guy's soft. He's an R&B guy. I'm not a fighter. I'm, I'm not a fight starter, but I'm a great finisher. I wouldn't say R&B and rap belong together, but sometimes they can be a great match if the collaboration is right. I understood that rap was an art form. The challenge became clear. How can rap and R&B come together? While I was standing in front of a hotel one sunny afternoon in Beverly Hills, the idea came to me. It came in the form of a drop top Bentley convertible. I was able to marry my music with rappers, Slick Rick, the Notorious Big, Dougie Fresh, Puff Daddy, Diddy, The Game, Big Timers, T.I., Lil John, Elephant Man, Cassidy, Little Kim, Young Jeezy, Missy Elliott, Rick Ross, Wyclef, Benny Siegel, Snoop Dogg, Houdini, Twista, Crucial Conflict, do or Die, Nor, Young Bloods, Busta Rhymes, Old OJ the Juice, Remy Ma, Swiss Beats, Genuine, Chameleon Air, Birdman, T Pain Clips, Ludacris, Joe Budden, Huey, Chingy, Kid Rock, Fabulous, Jaru Jadakiss, Big, Big Tiger, Lil Wayne, Nelly Gucci Man. Fat Joe, 50 Cent, Jay-Z Lloyd, Bow Wow, K-Nan, Boo and Goody, Boo and Gotti, <laughs> Bay Major, Nick Cannon, put them together and you get the best of both worlds. Yo Pac, yo Biggie. It was 1996. I had just left the lobby of the Hotel Nico. We called it the Hotel Negro because so many rappers and music business folks like, some, like staying there. I was I was standing out front waiting for my ride to arrive when I looked up and saw Tupac Shakur driving a badass Bentley. He was alone and I thought to myself, man, this nigga got some balls to be rolling by himself like that. Yo, Pac, 
I yelled at the top of my voice. He made a U-turn and jumped out the car. What up, baby? He asked. Just wanted to holler at you. I said, just had to tell you that I love everything you do. Hey, man, said Pot, coming from you. That's a hell of a compliment. Lots of cats say rap and R&B live in the different parts of the planet, but I don't see it that way, Pac. I see us all coming together. You feel me? Been feeling the same way. It's all the same thing. Beats, words, stories. Man, you need to do an album. We love it. I'm talking about the whole album, the whole concept, the big game changing record. You got it, Kells. Tell me what studio and when to be there. Going to send you some tracks, I said. Don't need no tracks. Just need to know you want to work with me. That's enough. We'll we'll just let it do. We'll just let it do what it do. <clears throat> God is good all the time, said Pac. We hugged and Pac went on his way. As the year went on, we made tentative plans to meet, but the plans got messed up when his schedule or mine suddenly changed. That didn't change our hearts, though. Every time we talked, we talked about how this marriage of rap and R&B had to happen in a big way. We figured we were the two artists to pull it off. Pac understood that we came from the same hood. We had mutual respect and mutual love. i go around saying no one is better at the rap game than Pac, and Pac would go around saying Kells is the most serious R&B thug out there. Come September, and it looked like my schedule was opening up just before the holidays, I set up a meeting with Pac for us to plot our strategy, get firm dates, and make the musical bomb that we knew would explode all over the world. But another bomb exploded that no one saw coming. I woke up Sunday, November 8th to the news that Pac had been shot in Vegas the night before he'd been rushed to the hospital. It didn't look good. Six days after the shooting on Friday the 13th, Tupac died. I was numb for the news, didn't know what to say or what to do except praise God for giving him a gift that he gave to us. Brilliant true life stories, beautiful real life poetry, Words that will keep on living as long as they are, there are eyes to read and ears to hear. On many different singles, I was able to marry my music with rappers who understood the natural bond between us. Even though our approaches were different, we contemplated each other, put them together, and you get the best of both worlds. A team that said, in my mind, when I decided to put together the master plan that got postponed after the death of Tupac, I can never think of Tupac without thinking of Biggie because the very next year we lost another rapper icon from whom I had the deepest respect. Biggie was a lyrical genius. He was a musical painter with words. As he rapped, you could see the picture come to life as you heard his story. You heard a lot of rappers rap. You hear a lot of singers sing, but you don't see the movie in your head the way you do when you hear Biggie rap. You relate in that way because I'm not, I'm into painting the picture and showing you the movie of what I'm singing about. So it was a natural thing for us to collaborate. Something would have been wrong with the earth if we hadn't done something together. When I got to Biggie's studio in New York, Biggie was in the back room messing around with his lyrics on the track. Then he came out and showed me the first track on F You Tonight. While I was listening to his verse, I was already hearing the chorus in my head. I didn't say anything and kept grooving to the track and I had the chorus immediately. Soon as I sang it, you must be you must be used to spending and all that sweet whining and dining. He stood up, he was tripping. That's it, that's right, it, that's it right there. He loved it just, a mat, just as much as I loved his verse. There was such a mutual respect between us. I didn't feel like I was working with just another rapper. I felt like I was working with someone who had a heart, someone who understood the significance of his own gift of and of mine and what it meant for them to merge together and for us to get together on the song. Biggie loved R&B music. He never felt that he was too tough for R&B. As with all the other rappers I've worked with, Biggie and I share common ground. Even though Biggie grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in Chicago, we came from the same hood. We knew the same characters. We've been through a lot of that same stuff. One time we were on tour together and we were staying at the same hotel in Detroit. It was late and the after party was over. The hotel lobby party was over. The hotel room party was over. There were still people hanging out in the lobby. And I was back in the lobby where they had this piano. I had just recalled the childhood dream with the cartoon characters chasing me. 
I remembered the melody from that dream and I was trying to figure out what the lyrics were, working on what would become I Believe I Can Fly. Big and his crew came by in the lobby about four in the morning. What's up, baby? Great show, baby. What you doing? He came over to the piano and I started to play it for him. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. But so far, that's all I had. I'm going to tell you right now, B, that's a smash. That's a big hit right there. That's a Grammy winner, Rob. When I was playing it for him, I was thinking, he's a hardcore rapper. This is going to be too soft for him. But when I got through and looked up, his face was wet with tears. My brother, he said, they going to be playing that when you and I have moved on to the other side of time. I was blown completely away because here was one of the greatest in rap recognizing a song that was about humanity, about uplifting people and feeling the power, the song that took me beyond Biggie, the rapper, or Biggie, the writer, that connected me with Biggie, the man. Biggie was the first person to hear me sing, I Believe I Can Fly. That was a great moment. The death of Biggie in 97 hit me just as hard as Tupac's death the year before. Another genius went down for reasons I never understood and still don't. Just a couple of months after he was killed, his album Life After Death dropped that included the collaboration of F&U Tonight. Biggie was among the first hardcore rappers to understand that mixing in pretty R&B with his raps made them more radio friendly. He also understood, as I did, that a club cut was different from a radio cut. Profanity had leaked from streets into rap and then into R&B. We all got caught up in it. I didn't mind singing a lyric like, I'm fucking you tonight in a club jam. I thought it fit into that slot perfectly, and so did millions of fans who bought the record. After that collaboration, rapper after rapper came knocking at my door, and I was happy to open the door and let them in. I took it as a compliment that they thought I could con contribute to their art form. When Fat Joe, for example, came to see me in a studio in Miami, he came with a deep respect. Thug as he was, street as he was, the man was all heart. Kells, he said, you got to write me a hit, bro. I'll do my best, Joe. Fat Joe didn't come along. Uh, Fat Joe didn't come alone. His posse must have been 20 deep, all hanging in the studio watching and waiting for me to come up with a killer jam. Tell you what, I said, I I, I do better when I work alone. Y'all take a walk or go to the beach. The ocean out there is really beautiful. Give me an hour and I'll come back and I'll come up with something. No problem, Rob, said Joe. Half hour later, him and his boys were back. Got something, Kills? Matter of fact, Joe, I do. Played the track, sound, sang the chorus, and Joe was all smiles. It's a monster, baby, he said. I like it myself. I said as I kept singing the chorus. We thugging, rolling on dubs. The jam we thugging hit big in late 2001. Soon all the big rappers were coming around, got to the point that a rap with the Kells chorus gave you even more street creed. Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh, The Game, T.I., Elephant Man, Little Kim, Missy Elliott, um, and the slew of others became club classics. These songs became part of my identity, both as an artist and a businessman. I like that identity as an artist, I was working with other serious artists. As a businessman, I saw club track. I saw club tracks as a new franchise that could profit, be profitable for years to come. It was like being McDonald's and realizing that even though cheeseburgers and fries so big, you could also make money serving up McRibs, which are also available for a limited time only. Beyond the fact that marrying rap and R&B made good artistic and business sense, the marriage was good for music lovers. It gave them what they were looking for. What are music lovers looking for? First thing is romance. Life can be boring. Romance is exciting. The thought that you might find real love is a beautiful thing. And if a song brings you that thought and helps you strengthen that hope, I say amen. Music also needs to speak to your spirit, your inner core, that part of your soul that can get dr uh, drowned by the drama of life. Don't matter if it's romantic, ballad, or a hot, sexy song. Music, at least the kind of music I do, has got to get all over your soul. And then there's escape. Everyone needs escape. I need escape. Come Friday and Saturday, Kells is going to party. You can't have a party without music. I don't care where you go around the world. You will see people in Africa, 
or England, in Jamaica or Japan, looking for a way to let off steam. During the week, we walk around all stiff and uptight. We have to be careful what we say to our boss or our teacher or our coworkers. We have to watch every step we take, every word that comes out of our mouths. Come the weekend, we're tired of holding it in. We got to let it out. We need release. We need relief. We need the club and all the good feelings that the club brings. Being up in the club in the VIP with the greatest rappers, whoever rocked the mic made me proud, made me feel like I was living right where my people were living. Like I said in my first album, my career was born in the 90s. We wanted to be part of my times. And it was and remains a great blessing that I could swing back and forth between cultures. Maybe I could even contribute to a conversation between those two cultures. When it came to music, there was no shame in my game. I'm at my best when I am wanted. And whoever reaches out to me is going to get my best. Bring on the rappers, baby. Let me keep dreaming that big dream where R&B and rap share the biggest stage in the world where R&B and rap go on the biggest tour in history. That dream was deep in my soul. It was going to happen. It had to. Okay, and here we're going to stop and, you know, just let this sink in. Like, it felt so good to hear that R. Kelly was moving to another level in his life. You know, he had went from opera to uh, playwriting, music, musical, to, well, he didn't get into playwriting and music until later with uh, Trapped in the Closet. But, I mean, I did not know that he was getting ready to make a um, album with Tupac and Biggie. And it's just amazing how this is all coming out in the book. How many of us as Kelly supporters knew that um, that he was in the industry of uh, rap. I mean, I I don't know where I was at during this time because um, and also in the upcoming um podcast with being in the semi pros, you know, it's like wow, this man was really just all over. He was like a beautiful spirit, just all over meeting all kinds of beautiful people. So I thank you for joining this podcast and uh we will see you tomorrow where we will talk about the semi pro um with him in 1997 at the age of 30 signing up with the Atlantic City Seagulls a semi pro team in the United States Basketball League which was according to him no public relations stunt so we'll see you tomorrow <laughs>